Now it's working. It's good to start with the microphone. And I <laughs> said that without checking. Well, you got in pretty early, rookie. So I think you'll be okay. Look, it's the back of my head. I feel like Del Maximum. Did you turn that light on? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if we need the streaming light on, Sylvia, but... Uh... I mean... Why are you hiding under the desk? So I can talk before more people get here. <laughs> okay. You're like a surprise attack? <laughs> There's a surprise attack under the table. Oops. Don't hit your head or anything. Uh, we're here. That's the size we are. Can you see me? Yeah, your face is visible. And Can you, you look extra me? weird like that. Can you see me? Super weird. Can you see me? No, just your hands now. Are you gonna draw without being on the screen? Uh, I didn't realize someone got here early. Yeah, they said first. As in first person in here to write something. It's a rotifer. It's coming to visit us. Yay! Hang on, I need to zoom out. We can't out. start the game until more people come. We can't start until the more people come? The game. What game? The drawing game. Oh, there's a drawing game? Um, it might be in your best interest to explain it at least once to me so I can see what it's like. And then later when people come, you can explain it again. How about that? Okay. So, um, I say, er, I say, um, I tell some, I tell, or I say, um, anyone say an animal name and then, the first person who says the name of, uh, of an animal is that animal I'm going to draw. Oh, did you hear that? Oh, Dangling's here. Maybe Dangling wants you to draw uh, something. It's got to be the name of an animal. Does a rotifer count? What? I'm just checking because I have a rotifer on the screen and I said the word rotifer, so does I don't count in the game? What's a rotifer? It's this thing. Oh. You gonna say hi to Dangling? Hi Dangling. Sound like you said hi Dingling. I'm telling her you called her a Dingling. <laughs> Is it Dangling? Oh, you said Dangling. Oh, Dangling wants you to draw a fox. On it. On it. There's a whole bunch of diatoms attached to this little piece of algae right here. A bunch of very small ones. That was a good choice, Dangling. She likes foxes, as you know. There's some larger diatoms attached right here. get to the live streams nobody cares about the diatoms on the SEM everybody wants to see the diatoms but they unless they're crawling around nobody cares that's the lesson here if you want to be magical you need cilia, cilia. yeah they need to be some kind of a cilia or a rotifer, or an amoeba, and then somebody cares. This little guy right here is a vorticella. Cool. It's got one of those retractable stalks. There's another one back there. You can see him sp spinning. 
Hey, Bon Bon, five five six. Hello. Wow, people are having a crazy. It's kids and adults doing homework stream together. Yeah, except for this isn't homework for me. And she's just drawing pictures of things that people request. So right now we've got a request in from uh, breaded shrimp for a fox. And Dangling wants to know, uh, what is this way of holding a pencil? <laughs> you got called out <laughs> for your pencil grip. Oh, you're not? I'm used to doing this. Well, I think you should draw with whatever way is most comfortable for you. This is your most comfortable. Uh, she says she's questioning how the fox will come out if you hold the pencil like that. I guess how you were holding it before. Probably outside of the lines, like a lot. Well, good thing there's no lines. You're drawing the fox, aren't you? The lines when I color stuff in. Oh, okay, I see. Your own lines. I think you're allowed to draw outside your own lines whenever you want. I mean, you made the lines, so at that point, you decide how they go. I learned this from my friend Little Chook. That's how she draws. She doesn't like the way she drew the line, she just draws it over. It's the line's fault, not hers. Wow. Oh, this, this one's got little, oh, that's cool. This one's little cilia aren't spinning very fast and you can actually see them. This is a pencil I've never Crazy. This. Or maybe they're just timed with the frames per second of I my camera. These pencils. The ones Let's take a look. Daddy! What? I, seen a pen I just saw a pencil that I've never seen before. You saw a pencil you've never seen before? Look. It's a brown pencil. Oh, because it's colorific? This is a normal. What's this pencil one say? Dice. Crayola. Crayola and then the color. This one says no color and it oh, has like a Oh, it's like a, like a special pencil somebody took from something else. Yeah. I don't yeah. know why it's in here. Oh, now it's starting to spin pretty good. You see it waving its little cilia around like crazy now? <laughs> That's so funny. Yeah. They're spinning. Hey, Sai Ming Lee, thank you for the follow. Newt, Newt. Newt, Newt. What's yeah, that on your shirt, I Sylvia? Meow kitty. Oh. Then I have something on the back too. It's a cat butt? No. Does it have the butthole? No. No? But it does have a tail on a fishy. The cat's yeah. underwater? Why's it got the fish in it? What are you doing? Leave your shirt on. I'm not. You're gonna get me busted. I'm not. What are you doing? I'm trying to get around my shirt so I can see it. There's fishies on the back. Yeah, there's fishies. You can't take your shirt off on the screen. That'll get us all busted. Big time. What is a newt newt? Oh, that's uh, that's just what we say whenever people um, join. <laughs> what are those books and did I read them all? Uh, the books that are in my background? I read all those books. Uh, some of them are Carlin's actually, but um, the ones on the lower shelves down here are textbooks and notebooks from classes. Hey, Mama Bon Bon. And uh, also, hi, uh, Tsai Ming. Where did I find my sample? Uh, actually, this sample came from my koi pond in the backyard. Yeah. And uh, if Sylvia let me steal the camera for a second, I could just point it right out the window at it.
Right out there. Is a koi pond. Uh, I just got goldfish in it right now because uh, something ate all of my koi. Sorry, I'm to knock things over. I brought the camera back, yeah. <laughs> um, I went out there earlier with a, uh, like a soup ladle, basically, and I just scraped a little bit from the side of the koi pond. They have sort of a plastic liner. And, uh, and there's a bunch of algae growing on it. Yeah, there's a bunch of algae that was growing on it. And I just scooped some of it up, put it in this little bowl, straight on to this uh, microscope from there. So that's nice. Uh, Newt Newt uh, for M9EZ is, um, aren't goldfish an invasive species? Well, I don't think they're native to this area. But um, in my koi pond everything is neat, is invasive because it's invasive I mean in a manner of speaking it's artificial there used to be yard there and now there's a pond so um, I'd rather have pond than yard yeah pond's pretty good except for the neighbor kids always throwing trash in it huh yeah a few days ago I found a pencil a yeah. broken he threw a pencil in our koi pond? Yeah, and I never found the other side. I need, I need to, uh... Well, probably a pencil will float. So that'll be okay. Yeah, but I saw, like, a yellow thing in the water. I was like, what the... So I grabbed it out. Yeah. There's, like, a weird kid who lives in the neighborhood who sneaks into our backyard and throws stuff into our koi pond from our yard. Or... Stop that. Yeah. We should have stopped letting him back there a long time ago. That, I believe, is a rotifer all scrunched up. Yeah. It's working on getting its head out. Uh, do I know about the YouTube channel called Journey of the Microcosmos? Yes, I do. I say you put Sylvia to fight the kid. Uh, well, the little kid's always trying to hit Sylvia, so I think probably a fight is imminent at some point. One of these times he's going to hit one too many times, and that'll be it. This pencil is called outer space. Like, it's backwards, so I don't think you guys can see it, but it's called outer space. Your pencil's called Outer Space? Yeah. Yeah, you, I don't think they can hear you very well because the microphone's way over here, so you got to talk up. Oh, that's the color. Yeah. Oh, Outer Space is the color, yeah. You love that channel and also Jam's Germs. Jam's also shows up on Twitch occasionally. Um, he's, uh, he's friends or whatever. He, he knows um, Pacific Plankton a little bit. And Pacific also does streams like this, and she also has a YouTube channel now. Um, you should follow it if you're interested in those things. She does a little stream. Uh, she's not doing live streams onto YouTube, but she has this thing called Pulse of the Plankton. And you can find it right there. And give her a follow. So she's coming on tonight as well. Tonight's sample, uh, Jiggly Enough, is just from my koi pond. I just pointed my camera out the window so they could see it. Um, you missed that part, but uh, I took a little soup scooper thing and I scooped a little bit of the algae off of the side walls. It's what the goldfish usually are eating from. So I stole a little bit of their food. Uh, but I also give them some food, so I think it's fair. What are you doing over here, Sylvia? I demand everyone follows Pacific Plankton on her channels or whatever. Oh, you demand? Mm hmm Everybody follow Pacific Plankton? Yes. On her channels, on all her channels? Yeah. Yeah. 
That's a good plan. Do you think that they take demands from kids? I don't know either. I guess we'll find out. You guys heard. Better do what she says. Or... Uh, she'll get mad at you and then there'll be a fight. And she's already in a fighting mood. So... Because you're talking about Sawyer. Well, we're not talking about a person we're not going to call their name out on Twitch. This one became detached and now it's just out here spinning around like a crazy little silly. <laughs> it's like a helicopter with no tail. <laughs> just going round and round. It's when the day a, passes every second. It's doing, a, doing a pretty good job of finding food though, I think. <laughs> when a day passes every second on Mercury. <laughs> You're rotating so fast. How's that fox drawing coming? Uh, this is a vorticella, and the vorticellas usually are attached um, by so a sort of a cable or thread-like structure. Um, we saw one earlier that was actually attached. That one's completely detached. Let me see if I can find one that's attached for you so you can see what I was talking about. This is what I have so far um, Vorticella and Epistylus are both pretty common and they're kind of similar, but the Vorticella usually have a, uh, a the ability to sort of retract up and down the thread. That's another one right there. Same thing. Well, that one's not attached either, so they must also have some sort of a phase where they can get detached and then go find a new place to attach. That's a rotifer. Uh, but it's a rotifer together with a bunch of vorticella. Nope, those might be epistylus. They don't look like they can retract. Um, but uh, here, we'll zoom in on those. They're very similar. They're basically vase shaped. And um, around the top, they have little hairs, cilia, um, that they spin and they use to pull the food in towards their mouths. And we're super zoomed in, sorry about that. I'm gonna zoom out a little bit. And you can see the particles basically being drawn towards them. I get the focal height right, you can see those particles moving around because they create a little current. I know the battery light's flashing, just ignore it. Oh no, those ones can pull themselves back in. So I think they're vorticella. Uh, Dangling's giving you some advice about your fox. She says it needs black or brown on the tips of the ears. Oh yeah. Yeah. Jiggly enough I agrees with me, it's a vorticella. A little bouquet. You see that one open up and then start spinning? So when they get perturbed, they'll they contract and then they'll restart, restart their motors. Oh, it says hi everyone. We have our first drawing. This is a fox. It says, hi everyone. Hopefully you can read that and see it. Jiggly enough says, hi fox. Do we need a new animal? Yeah. We need a, we need the, a new request for say a different animal, animal from say chat. Say any, anyone in chat say an animal's name. First person to give us an animal. A sloth, okay. Let's a play. sloth. Okay. You know what a sloth looks like? Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> we'll we'll put we can't get a fox again. That's we already had a fox. It was Dangling wanted you to draw another fox apparently. <laughs> She's just gonna say fox every time, probably. Uh, and then there was also a request for a snake and a penguin. Okay, snake is next and then the random thing. No penguin. Or are you not drawing penguins for some I'm reason? Penguins. 
refused to draw a penguin. Uh, I do, Siming. Um, it's just uh, if you go to YouTube and just Google Diatoms Attack or type it in the uh, type it in the uh, searchy field, it'll come up with me. I don't think I put the YouTube channel for me on here, but maybe I did. No. <laughs> Do diatoms attack anything? Uh, maybe phosphorus? I don't know, do nutrients count? They're not really capable of attacking anything. Uh, but if there's a lot of them, I guess you could consider it an attack. But they're not attack! really... They don't really attack anything. They're malevolent. No, no, they're benevolent, not malevolent. Uh, I, that's what's funny about it, you know, to me anyway got a weird sense of humor like that, I suppose. Um, the real backstory for that uh, name is um, when I first heard, when I first learned about diatoms, it was a long time ago. I, a long time ago, I, um, I had a friend, I still have her, uh, Jackie, who was a diatomist. Uh, at the time, she was working in the field with me and I learned all about diatoms and then I just thought they were hilarious so um, I told her I wanted to make a band called um, diatoms attack formation uh, and I was gonna use that as my login for uh, for Twitter whenever I made a Twitter account uh, diatoms attack formation like you were commanding them to form an attack formation. And uh, it was too long for for Twitter. So I just went with Diatom's attack. You and then, uh, attack. yeah. And then uh, when I made the Twitch account, I just wanted to have the same thing as my Twitter account. So I came over to Twitch from Twitter um, following some of uh, these great microscope streamers. Most of you probably know them, but I usually just have a little squad command in here. There's a whole list of microscope streamers that you can check out. And um, uh, Pacific Plankton and Del Maximum and A Tiny World. Somehow I took A Tiny World off of there. She hasn't streamed a lot recently. Um, but they were the... Uh, streamers that were only streamers that used microscopes early on, and also Freckled Science would sort of use it occasionally. Um, and now she uses it kind of regularly. So I added her back into that list. But um, Jolkson, I think Jolkson was on when I started. He might, he or she might still be on. But if you like microscope streamers, I, I recommend you follow everyone on there. So pack is coming up at, um, Midnight, Eastern Time. And then Dell usually also shows up on... Um, oh, you already ascribed to, to Tiny World? Oh, on YouTube. Okay, good. I know she streams on, like, Facebook and YouTube, and she has some other platforms that she uses. And I've been on her podcast um, for the podcast thing that she does. Um, so we've been, you know, friends for a long time. Internet friends. And, um, I'm going to zoom out for a second. Ignore the scale bar, it's wrong for the moment. And, um, oh, there's a ciliate. I haven't looked at your ciliate screen in a while. <laughs> Look at that little guy. I think that's Euploides. Has little walkie legs. Away. It's getting away. Um, I'm 
I'm gonna just tweak the uh, settings for a second here. There we go. Get that rich DIC lighting. As we follow this little guy around. This is a extra level of challenge, trying to keep up with the tiny crawling things and chat. Uh, yeah, um, District 10 Mushrooms uh, is a, he studies uh, mushrooms. He's a fungi guy. And uh, streams from microscope. Um, oh no, it went to the other side of the, oh, it came back in. I was gonna say that's the cover slip edge right there. It it's went under the uh, edge of the cover slip. <laughs> Am I a Kardashian? No. Oh, you're talking to Simple Garrick. Um, you see how it flew back in? I guess it sucked back in. Um, uh, District 10 Mushrooms recently moved and they haven't gotten their um, stream stuff set back up since they moved and moved to a new house. So they had to like pack everything up and unpack everything. But uh, yeah, mushroom streaming. So I got mushrooms in there. How was Terraria yesterday? Uh, we got to the first boss. Um, and we were going to, I think we're gonna do, um, we're gonna do it again on Saturday as a team. Do another stream from the Spirit University stuff. Um, that's the plan anyway. Oops, trying to keep up with the rotifers a little bit harder. I wish it would attach to something. I'm gonna lose it. Okay. And then gun. With my sloth. There we go. Oh! Oh my goodness, that's a great sloth. I don't know if you guys have been watching, but check this one out. Huh? All that happened while we were busy looking at microbes. You got a sloth right there. You want a new in animal yelled out, or do you want to go with snake? A new animal yelled out. Okay, because somebody did yell out a beaver, but they yelled it out in French. What <laughs> is it? Siming says your sloth is cute. And Rod says that's a great drawing, and Jiggly Enough says very nice. And uh, Von Von giggled and said nice. Oh my gosh, Ryan. I have to fit 100 um, pencils in this, in this pencil ah. Um. So I have, um, Sai Ming, that's great. Um, I have a, the uh, EM1 Mark, uh, this one here is the, um, EM1 Mark II, and I actually have an EM1 Mark III now as well, and my EM5 uh, Mark II I lent to my niece. So she was using it to stream, and she wanted to have a nice camera. Yeah, I know, the battery's flashing because um, it got swapped out earlier, and I have more, I hope. I want to do something else. Oh, you want to draw something else? Actually, I want... Okay, so... What's so, going to happen now? You change the rules? So someone say the, uh, their favorite animal in the chat. Someone in the chat needs to say their favorite animal. And then I'll draw it. Isn't that what you've been doing? I've been drawing an animal that the same. Oh, it may not be your favorite. Okay, it's got to be someone in the chat's favorite animal. Um, but I have more batteries, Siming. Mean, it's okay. Um... The road of her left. Oh, uh, Matthias says giraffe. That's a good animal, actually. And Saturn says their favorite is a dragonfly, and what Rod a says a deer, deer and Siming says a panda. Or a penguin. Hi, Saturn. How's it going? It I, uh, I had a rotifer in here, and 
then uh, got distracted by the seven-year-old. So, oh, we're up against the edge. That's the edge of my uh, cover slip. Actually, put two. There's a big one right there, scooting around. There's a couple of them. They became detached, but I think those are still um, the same thing. I think those are vort vorticella. They just have detached themselves. Actually, that one looks like, oh no, they're both still detached. They're swimming around. Oh, uh, Anthrier says, eagles are amazing. And Rod says, if I can add a drawing request, a rainbow trout would be what? awesome. You know what a rainbow trout is? Oh, well, it's like a normal trout, except for its belly is sort of pink, and its back is kind of, I don't know, greenish colored, I guess? And they look a little bit like a rainbow. Yeah. Sort of like silvery pink and and green. All right, I'm going to pop over to uh, the other side of the slide and see if we can find anything besides Vorticella in here. There's a lot of them. Um, this thing right here, that's not moving. That looks like a little caterpillar. That is, uh, Cenodesmus. And they're actually a plankton, a uh, green algae. And, um, they have like little horns that stuck off of them that are right here. These four little horns that are sticking off of the last cell. And those help it float. So they're little green algae. They fill those with air, with gas. And that allows them to float a little bit better. And um, they're actually really interesting. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. When they occur and you find them in their uh, natural state, they either have one, two, four, or eight cells in their colonies and this one has eight and i'm not surprised by that because um, the number of cells that they make is usually in response to whether or not there are fish in the pond and if there are fish that can consume them they make longer colonies and yeah so they grow in this sort of um this sort of fashion eight's the maximum they never have more than eight so, um, but they make longer colonies intentionally if there's fish present in the water. And so usually if they have four or eight, it's because they have fish. And um, the response is like uh, a chemical one. They can tell from what's being eaten in the water that something is eating algae. Hey, Pacific. Uh, I got a request to stream from, you know who? Yeah, uh, no, they get damaged and then they die, but the chemicals that they give off when they are ruptured, you've got to go. It's 3 a.m. in France. Oh, first time here. Anthrier, uh, hopefully you'll give us a follow if that's the case, if you haven't already. And check out those uh, streamers that I mentioned above if you haven't seen them. Here's a list of them for you. Give them a follow. It doesn't cost anything to follow people on Twitch. And uh, then when they stream, you'll know it's happening. So all these people are microscope streamers. Oh, there is a tiny world in that list. Um, you can give them a check out. That'd be great. I recommend them. All of them. I don't like my giraffe, but also it has a mustache. Oh, the giraffe has a mustache? Yeah. Oh, that reminds me, I was supposed to put a mustache uh, emote in here that you can put on things. I don't really like it. I think it's a giraffe. All right. Have a good evening, Anthrier, or... Good morning, good night, good night. Yes, yeah. get some rest. Um, in that list, of course, is Pacific Plankton, and she's gonna be streaming in a few hours here. And I think I'm gonna be on that stream as a, a talking, talking mustached person uh, in the corner somewhere. Oh, that guy is spinning like crazy. Let's see what it's doing. No, I'm 
So this is actually my second stream for today. Uh, earlier I was streaming from the scanning electron microscope and I was looking at some materials from Pacific Plankton. Yeah, it's spinning pretty good. Don't even show this to hit them. Why not? I don't like it. Um, it helps if I show it to them though. Also, they could see while you were drawing it. So I'm just saying, it's abstract. Look at this. Huh? It's a giraffe. It's creepy. It's creepy? Yeah. Uh, well, people liked it. So if you don't like it, other people can still like it. <laughs> Little boggle burr. Mm -hmm. Uh, yes. Can I go back to the algae interaction with fish? Why do they grow longer colonies when there are fish in their environment? Oh, the guy who asked for it, the person who asked for it said they like it. So, you know, shouldn't be too mad about it. And also, Pacific Plankton says creepy can be cool. I don't know if you saw uh, Jay Renzella's new artwork, um, but uh, I think Pacific Plankton commissioned him to make some sort of a crab merman thing, which is pretty creepy, so. It got deposited and somebody quit from that, I guess. Not sure why. Um, so why do they grow longer colonies? Uh, longer colonies means uh, two things. One, um, if you make yourself bigger, it's not just fish, it's anything that eats them, by the way. What are you up to, Wednesday? Uh, longer colonies means it's harder for them to fit into things' mouths, mostly. So that's just a, a thing. If you're long enough, if you're small enough and you fit in something's mouth, it'll eat you. And if they can tell that their neighbors are being digested um, from the chemicals in the water, they will uh, make themselves longer in just the possibility that basically they might not get eaten, right? So. <laughs> you can design monsters for horror games and horror movies or comics. Yeah, that's good. Uh, you see some bubbles. Oh, those are probably bacteria, actually. The little things moving around in there, they're too small for algae. Um, for most algae, anyway. Um, the little things that are floating are probably mostly bacteria. There might be some heterotrophic uh, nanoflagellates in there as well. But um, this one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. So you can see these are also making longer colonies in the um, Cenodesmus that are right there. And Cenodesmus usually go nuts in my koi pond because uh, there's a lot of fish in there and they make a bunch of nutrients. And that actually leads to um, algal growth. And um, there's not a lot of silica in the water so there's a little bit of silica in there that diatoms are using, but um, not a ton. And so the, um, the main algae that are in that water are um, in the summer are Cenodesmus and they get trapped in my um, uh, pond filter quite regularly, so. Um, that's a rotifer. So I saw somebody asked, what is that? Um, you can tell it has a little antenna on the top of its head and then it's, it sort of crawls around. You can see its back leg is just about in focus right now. You see it's got little spiky toes that it uses to grip things with. It has one foot and then on the top of their heads, uh, little cilia, cilia. Um, it's a, uh, it's its own little group of things called rotifers, and uh, they, um, the cilia are used the same way most of the other things are. They, um, they spin them, they create a current that draws stuff towards their mouth, and then they eat from that. So, uh, this one has climbed back into the uh, pile of cladocera. There's a whole bunch of these um, in the background back there. There's a whole bunch of 
Vorticella again is spinning. Uh, why can't the algae grow larger than egg cell? I don't know. I don't actually don't know why they only are in two, one, two, four, and eight, but they don't. They, you know, their cells double basically. So I think when they get to eight, what happens is the colony splits apart every time. So, what are you doing? Trying to make my life hard by sitting on the arm of my chair? Trying to hide from stream but somehow see what's going on on channel chat? Is that what I'm seeing? I mean, they can see me on the second camera behind. Yeah, they can see you. Oh, here's a whole bunch of Vorticella. Ooh, that's a pretty view. There's a cat. Uh, that's Wednesday. I don't know where she went. Uh, Sylvia's probably chased her out. Oh, we got a message from Mommy. Sylvia's got 15 minutes until bedtime. Sylvia, did you hear that? Huh? Mommy says you got 15 minutes to bedtime. She's watching your stream. Okay. You better hurry up and draw something if you're going to draw something else. Is that your plan to draw something? Yeah, so, um, a flock of balloons. They are a little bit like balloons. Uh, or kites, maybe. After it's actually more like a kite, because they spin their little cilia and pull themselves out really taut on their string, like a kite does. Uh, except for the kites can't recoil, right? Um, they're attached, all of them, to Clodophora, which is um, this green algae that's right here. It's uh, like a, a large, they grow really large strands, and all along the sides of the koi pond, they also grow pretty well, and the goldfish eat off of these things, so the ones that are in the pond. That skill bar is correct, by the way, right now. <laughs> oh, mommy wants to know if you know what a bandicoot is. I don't know where she went to the bathroom or something. Yeah, Indian is still on Eastern time. And uh, parts of it aren't. Parts of it are in Central. Um, Mommy wants to know about drawing, you know what a bandicoot is? I do. Oh, well she recommended a bandicoot. Okay. And then you could take the drawing up to mommy when you're done with it. Okay. So the parts that are near like, um, Chicago. Oh, you can see what happened right down there in the corner? The Cenodesmus is getting pulled towards the, um, Vorticella and it hit it in the face, right? It <laughs> smashed into one of them and then they retracted after they got hit in the face with it. <laughs> Is it a murder of balloons? Pacific Plankton wants to know what your favorite thing to draw is. And uh, there's a game called Crash Bandicoot. Have you ever heard of that one? Oh. Well, you might like it. <laughs> Headshot. <laughs> hey, open set. How's it going? Like, uh, we got Sylvia drawing in the background, and I've got this, uh, look at that. I don't even need to say it anymore. I can just do that. People can read. They can read about open set. If you don't know who open set is, you should be following open set. It's going to be one of your better decisions you make on Twitch. Some little rotifers. These ones are attached to something so I don't have to chase them quite so hard. I think 
of course, the moment I said that, they detached. I think I'm ready to go to bed, so bye everyone. Wait, did you draw your bandicoot? Can we see it? No. Oh, it's for mommy only? Mm -hmm. Okay. I have to change the title. People are going to expect drawings. You see, you said bye to everyone? I think they're all saying bye. Uh, let me show you. Hang on. Uh, good night, Sylvia. Yeah. This is a rotifer right here. If this is the thing you're asking about. That's a rotifer. It has a foot with a clawed end that uses to grab onto news, things. Everyone. Hey, Skywatcher, thank you for the follow. Uh, and then at the front end of its head, little cilia. And it's using them to pull stuff towards its mouth. And also they can use them to fly a little bit in the water, like a motorboat. News, uh, if they everyone. let go of their feet, basically, it will pull them along. That's a diatom, and all of these little things that are attached to the outside of the Clodophora are also diatoms, I believe. Little tiny Good ones. News, everyone. And that's a diatom. That one's dead, or mostly dead. And then there's some little tiny things in here. Not positive about what those are. Ciliates, probably. Man, there are so many these really pretty Boracella colonies just spinning away out here did a pretty good job with my soup spoon catching them <laughs> mostly dead yeah uh, let's see we don't need to be looking through that anymore. Nobody needs to be staring at the back of my head for most of the screen. Oh, it's available for Twi for uh, for Switch. Okay, and she does play on the Switch. Is that one carrying around baggage? Not on purpose. Um, it seems like it is dragging something, but it's not on purpose. It's also a Castro trick. They're my favorite. There you go. I like them because they don't swim so fast and they're pretty. They're like little sort of snails. They're not snails, they're castro tricks, but... Hairy belly, yeah. Castro means stomach, or belly. for me by swimming around in random directions. I've been practicing though. Also, so if you turn this on, so I just left it on, but it does, does not need to be on. Oops. job catching that one again. If I do say so. Boots of swiftness. It's moving pretty quickly for a little tiny thing. 
Is it glowing? No, that's just the light. Um, it looks like it's glowing because my my light's at the right focal height that it just glows. So that's my... It's the DIC lighting that's causing it to do that. I could turn it down a little by turning the background up. But also there's a light, you know, in the microscope. And um, it's a little bit of refraction around the edge that I can't do much about. So I actually kind of like it better in the dark, like this. Yeah, pertaining to hair. There's also, uh, there's a uh, cyanobacteria called gliotrichia. It does look like a hairball. I don't know what glios, what the prefix glio means though. myself by zooming out a bit. Are you trying to scare me or it? Hmm? Are you trying to scare me or it? You mean like it. The thing on the screen. It's a gastro trick. Aren't those cool? Very graceful. It's like this and Lacrimaria are my two favorite little beasties. <laughs> he looks like a Steve. Uh, do cyanobacteria produce oxygen? Absolutely. Uh, cyanobacteria are autotrophs and like all autotrophs that um, are photos. Oh, there goes a vorticella flying by. Got detached and it just was using its cilia like the same way that the rotifers do to basically fly from one place to the next. It was pretty cool, wasn't it? Just did like a... Woof! It got hit by something. Some sort of slide mechanics going on right there. We lost it. It's a very little one. I think they sometimes get much bigger. The little spikes on the sides, uh, I mean, they're just little cilia. <laughs> he was always doing gastro tricks. Um, I don't know if I want to know what those tricks are. I did have a kid who sat in one of my classes uh, in a lab that I had and I never quite understood what was going on but all the people around him were always making really bad like scrunched up faces and I thought for a while they were just didn't like my lecture but I think it turns out he was farting like through the whole class. Like every, every week as people started sitting farther and farther away from him in the classroom. I don't know if those are the Castro tricks you're talking about, but <laughs> it wasn't a treat, I'll tell you that. <laughs> yeah, but he didn't seem to mind uh, that he was making everybody suffer. I think he was enjoying it on some level. Uh, let's see. Oh, Glia from Glue. Okay. Uh, let's see. I missed part of this. I was never good at this part of this war. I talked about how they changed the atmospheric composition and made atmosphere toxic to life that wasn't used to oxygen before. Yeah, so I mean, that's um, the earliest organisms on Earth that we know of that left fossils are the cyanobacteria from... Um, from stromatolites, and uh, they did. 
they generated oxygen and at the time oxygen was basically toxic to most organisms because uh, there weren't a lot of environments that had a ton of oxygen um, in the same way that carbon dioxide would be poisonous to us if we got too much of it uh, today and ultimately they converted our atmospheres and our oceans into places where oxygen became the thing that we need for life it's a pretty cool uh, transition is the mouth on the front end? Yes. I think so. I don't think I can see the mouth very easily, but their whole head is up there, so. Um. Without considering species that exist now and haven't been discovered yet, do you think new ones will start to appear in the next 10 to 20 years? Um, it's hard to figure out um, what's new versus what's evolved new versus what we haven't just haven't found before. Um, but I mean, organisms are evolving all the time. And um, like diatoms, for example, there's a subset of um, diatoms that belong to like Lindavia in the Intermedia family that are what we call species flocks. Like we can't separate them cleanly today, but they clearly are starting to evolve into these sort of a cloud of things that haven't completely separated yet. And the problem is like, where do you draw the line? Um, it's, it's hard to, you know, like we define species as it's completely artificial in a way. It's like a sort of combination of characters that we determine, you know, there's sort of constructs in a way. Um, and then there's sort of a gradient around them. And if they don't have anything that's kind of close to them, and it's pretty easy, like humans don't have anything pretty close to them anymore. Um, but if they have many, many things that are very similar to them that are around, then it's very difficult to figure out what we should be calling a species versus, you know, subspecies or varieties or something else. And, you know, so it comes down to these kind of taxonomic decisions. But, um, but if we were going to see new species, that's where they would come from, like species clouds, things today that we can't quite separate. Some of them might actually get separated. Um, you know, that they might become different enough, basically, that we would call them separate things. Um, there's like an argument among some of the diatom taxonomists, for example, that we're off by an order of magnitude, by like things that we're calling cyclotella, for example, are probably each thing that we're calling a species today is probably more like a genus. Like we're off by a whole order of magnitude for some organisms. We just don't even know um, what actually belongs at the species level because there's so much cryptic diversity. Like somebody looked closely, um, Evelyn Pinsel looked very closely at Pinular Pinularia borealis and she found something like 28 cryptic species where you couldn't tell the difference from their skeleton as different species, but if you look at them genetically, they were and distinct enough that they should be considered species probably, but we can't tell by looking at their skeletons. So that's a good example of that um, issue where it's, you know, it's like, how do you divide things is, is just problematic. My battery eventually did go out. I'll be back in one second. was more like three seconds but last time we had a pull <laughs> do we have any way to see algae from thousands of years ago we definitely do uh, as OpenSet mentioned, you're in the right stream for that. Um, the, they are di there are diatoms that um, uh, I have on slides in the other room that are 
um, close to 4 million years old. And I have some other slides at school. I don't think they're here at home with me that are 10 million, 10 million year old diatoms in them. I found our gastro trick again. Um, so, yep, we can do that. Yeah, they were confused about the taxonomy of pandas and red pandas. Just name anything. We, you know, we struggle basically to figure out where things belong because we just don't have, um, even when you have genetic information sometimes, you just, it's hard to tell how they fit together. It's not easy. Um, there's not really a magic solution for a lot of this stuff. Yeah, open set. I imagine human transportation of organisms to new isolated regions has been one of the big catalysts for starting the development of new species and intruding organisms in the small islands and whatnot. So that's an argument that's been made in the world of diatoms as well, open set. In fact, um, if you look at the genus level diversity in diatoms, they, they've noticed basically it seems to be ramping up, like we're seeing more and more genera of diatoms. And part of the reason they believe that is because um, that they, th they think that their new genera um, is because they think that the diatoms are basically co-evolving with humans because we can be agents of transport and um, very likely are moving them around in the landscape um, Good news, everyone. to new environments that they don't exist in. And in fact, this is the topic of my most recent publication. Um, we found disjunct populations of Asterionella, sorry, Discostella Asterocostata, which is a species that was normally found in China and Japan. And we found whole populations occupying uh, lakes and rivers in, um, in North America and nothing in between. So um, this, what we call disjunct populations are really challenging because how else could they have gotten from China and Japan to the US without people. I mean, it's possible that there's something that we're not aware of that might transport them. But if it's like birds, why didn't they stop in between, right? And, um, you know, it can't be fish because they would have to, well, let me rephrase that. It can't be fish swimming from one place to another because it had to cross oceans. Uh, it could be wind, but then again, why don't we see anything in between, right? So um, we have these completely disjunct populations. It creates an issue. Um, are there any studies on diatoms affecting, affected by radioactivity? Yes. Um, in fact, there's a whole genus of diatoms called Crateroportula or Crateroportula uh, is the, oh, sorry, that's a feature on them as well. I think that's also their genus name. I don't remember what their genus name is, but they have a structure on them called Crateroportula. Um, that uh, they were found in uh, radiation, um, the cooling ponds from radiation from uh, nuclear power plants. So um, in the old days, nuclear power plants, I think they were exposed to nuclear radiation at really high temperatures as a result, and that uh, the two things basically led them to evolve into a new genus. Um, I don't know about a direct effect on diatoms other than people have looked at UV radiation. I think you're talking about, um, I think when you say radiation, you're talking about like ionizing radiation, not UV radiation. Um, but there's a lot of studies on diatoms and UV radiation. Um, and in fact, um, like most algae, diatoms are designed with photo repair mechanisms that they use to um, recover from UV radiation. Um, lots of these organisms, including diatoms and other algae, um, they have all kinds of photo repair processes. So they take damage from UV light during the day, and then at night they regrow themselves basically and repair the damage to their DNA. Um, that, that's a regular process for basically all algae and most plants actually. The DNAs of Vorticella, rotifer, gastrotric, tardigrades, etc. have been sequenced probably, but um, I mean, if you were looking for something new that nobody's looked into the DNA for or, uh, or whatever, 
uh, I would start with soil mites. There's like hundreds of thousands of soil mites or tens of thousands of soil mites that don't have names. <laughs> I mean, if you're looking for like the, uh, the unknown frontier, I think that's probably a bigger one. Um, they're not as cute, but, um, but there's a lot of them and nobody knows anything about them. And I mean, like literally the, the, uh, uh oh, we, did we get raided? Oh, it's Ensaladasaurus. Hello, Jess. How are you doing? We're looking at uh, Gastrotrick. Um, are you in here yet? Or are you still trying to make a transition from the other channel? Hi, how are you doing? Um, hang on, I got this thing for you, Jess. Watch. Look at that. Uh, you got your own bot command on my robot. Um, I was waiting for you to come visit me. And... Uh, Good news, everyone! I knew it would happen eventually. So... How was your stream? Hopefully it was great. <laughs> Is that a real thingy? It's definitely a real thingy. It's a gastro trick. Um, we've been chasing it around for a little while here. Math Monday. Okay, good. Um, thank you for the raid. And, uh, I'm just answering questions about, uh, diatoms and evolution and, uh, chasing this gastro trick around at the same time. So, um, apparently news, I'm trying to set the difficulty as high as possible, keeping something in focus, chasing it while it moves and answering complicated questions about things that are a little bit outside of my field of study. Good news, everyone. Um, I'm glad you raided me, and, um, yeah, Jess and I have been following each other for a long time. We're both on each other's recommended streamer list, I think. Um, she's definitely on mine, and I think I saw me on hers, so, um, I was streaming earlier today from the SEM as well, so I've made it a day. Good news, everyone! And then, if you can believe it, uh, later... At midnight, I'm going to be on Pacific Plankton stream. So, if you're not following Pacific Plankton or any of the other microscope streamers and you think microscope streaming is cool, here's a whole list of them. And uh, they all do different things. Uh, they all do kind of different, uh, different microscope stuff and have different approaches, but um, it's a great little community. It constantly grows. That list used to have like four people on it. And now it's a giant list, and I'm very excited to be part of that community. And um, maybe I should leave this gastro trick alone for a little bit. <laughs> Am I sleeping? Nah, I don't need to sleep. Uh, it's um, it's finals week for my students, and so um, that means I don't have to lecture. And I don't give them any finals except for in one class where they just have a regular quiz. So all of my students have to write papers this week, and uh, and that means I don't have anything to do until like they turn them in, and um, that probably won't start happening till Thursday or Friday. So I've got a little bit of time where I just don't feel like I have a whole lot to do, and I wasn't planning on streaming when I got home, um, but my daughter started demanding that I do it, and uh, she was gonna draw stuff, and then she got yanked off to bed. Uh, when it hit 9.15 or something. So you just missed my daughter. She was drawing animals on request. We got a fox and a giraffe and a bandicoot and uh, something else. Uh, maybe that was it uh, out of her before she gave up on it. Do I like lecturing? Uh, yeah, I like lecturing. I don't like writing lectures. Um, well, let me rephrase that. If I had a lot of time, I would like to write lectures. Uh, it's fun to give lectures and to present um, to people. Actually, the sort of performance side of my job is fun, but um, uh, when I have to teach and write lectures at the same time, it's like I don't sleep and I've got so much work to do all the time as a result. Um, that's not cool. Like being busy all the time and working super hard and having no weekends to myself uh, I don't appreciate that part, but um, 
actually delivering lectures I like. Um, I actually have fun teaching people and um, I like to write my lectures in innovative ways and uh, keep people interested in them. So yeah, I do. Oh, a sloth. Yeah, thanks, I mean, sorry. Um, do I know the YouTube channels Jartopia and Life in Jars? They grow stuff in terrarium jars and they take small samples. I don't, but that sounds like Del Maximum. He keeps all of his stuff in jars and then he takes stuff out all the time and looks at them. You need a microscope so you can join a cool people club? Um, you're already in the cool people club, Jess. Um, you just need a microscope so that we can add you to the list. That's, that's different. Um, but you're already cool. There's no doubt about that. I have two cover slips on this slide because it was a little sloppy when I was making it. And uh, so this is the other half of the slide we haven't gotten to yet. Let me find some more Vorticella for us. There's a lot of them in here. Oh, there's another gastro trick. It's not alone. Oh, here's some Vorticella. Some really pretty... Do you see they're spinning those little things on the tops of their heads? Like helicopters. There they go. And uh, they create a little current they pull stuff towards themselves. You can see little particles moving towards them, debris particles. What happened? I didn't fall asleep. Why not? I don't know. You don't either. Uh, these are Forticella. Okay, so I'm gonna just, I, oh, Jay's here. Hey, John, how's it going? Uh, you know what, I've got a, I've got this thing for John as well. Look at that. If you're not following uh, Pacific Plankton or um, J. Renzella or Enceladosaurus, you should do yourselves a favor. Great streamers. And um, right now, John was drawing uh, on a stream last night. Uh, he was drawing and carving uh, a bit of artwork that was um, uh, commissioned by Pacific Plankton. So there's a perfect crossover right there. Yeah, it takes so much work to prep a lecture. I don't think people realize how much it takes, Jess. And I tell my students, oh, on an average lecture, if it's a new lecture that I'm working on for a new topic I've never covered before, for one hour of talking to people, it takes me 10 hours of prep time. So every class period that I'm teaching is 10 hours to get that one hour to deliver to people, to research it, and to to get the information updated and to get good graphics or figures and um, to showcase what it is that I wanna show people. So this is what, uh, Vorticella are pretty neat. They can retract themselves up those little strings they're attached to. They can also break free of what they're attached to and then they turn into little helicopters and go flying by, so. Uh, what do I mean by write in innovative ways? Um, oh, thanks for uh, checking us out, Love Phone. I know you're, uh, I think you're like a, a mod for Enceladosaurus, right? Um, thanks for hanging Good out. News, everyone. Um, also, thanks for the follows. Uh, what do I mean by innovative ways? I don't know, I, I just, uh, I don't take a standard approach to lecturing a lot of times. I have my own, I don't, I don't take the textbook manufacturers, lectures, I don't, I just do my own thing. And sometimes I like to just sort of come at things from a different direction as a result. Um, <laughs> she has a singing dog. I mean, that's pretty cool. I don't, my cat will look in the microscope, so, I mean, I don't know if that makes me cooler or what, but I don't need to be cooler. I'm cool enough. Um, yeah, there was a detached Vorticella. It just went, it went zooming by on the screen once or twice. We had a couple of those.
Yeah. It's just a massive amount of prep. Um, and I just don't think people don't get it. Um, you know, uh, sometimes my graduate students have to teach classes. And um, so when we have PhD students, they're required to teach a class. My PhD students will sometimes, um, they'll start and I'll give them all of the, you know, it's like a class I've already taught and I'll give it, uh, I'll give them my lectures, my exams, my homeworks, everything. Here it is. And it still takes them basically all of their time, um, even with all the materials. Um, <laughs> all right, Pacific, um, I'll see you in like two hours. I'll be on your stream, right, as a talking head. Well, my head might not be there, but my voice will be. So um, I'm going to do a little vocal co-stream with uh, Pacific Plankton. She's looking at some samples from San Francisco Bay. And uh, we hang out all the time, so either on stream or off stream. In my Discord, too, so if you wanted to uh, hang out with us at some point, you might do that here. Um, am I related to Bob Ross in any way? I don't think so. I was going to put on, I have a funny little, like, uh, curly-haired wig I was going to wear um, anytime like people could force me to wear. I might add that as a, uh... <laughs> um, once in a lifetime. Um, I would rather do, let's see if I was gonna pick a talking head song. Good news, everyone. Um, I'm trying to think what my favorite talking head song would be to play. I, I like all of them. I mean, I really love the talking heads, but um, Hang on a second. I'm going to look through my list of talking head songs and then I'll, I'll tell you which one I think I'd probably like to. If it was me and I was picking one out, what song I would want to sing? Um, oh, this must be the place. That's the one I would pick. Yeah, I like that song a lot. It's a good talking. Talking Heads have a bunch of good songs. Oh, there's a little Euglena. It's a tiny Euglena. It's so small. Euglena are very hardy and also um, facultative heterotrophs. They can switch between being um, autotrophs this one you can clearly see has chloroplasts. Um, that's not food it's been eating. That's actually its, um, its own chloroplasts. And they have a little uh, red dot uh, in the eye around the head section, which is their eye, uh, which is like a light sensor. And um, Euglena are super interesting. Um, they can also handle really crazy amounts of UV radiation. Who was asking about UV radiation earlier? Um, we have uh, uh, one of our former faculty was studying euglena in acid mine drainage, and we, they were making stromatolite uh, reefs in the water and uh, in the streams outside the acid mine drainage areas. And it was like these things, and not this particular species, but this group, and, uh, and a diatom species, uh, Nitsia tubicola, and that was all that could live in the stream because the pH would sometimes get down to like 0.5 um, because the waters coming out of the uh, mines basically would be uh, in um, affected by the sulfur in the coal to make sulfuric acid. And so um, when the water was flowing out of the mine areas, basically the pH of the stream would be something like 0.5. And so all the other organisms were basically dead except for one Nitsia and a set of Euglena. And they pulled these Euglena out, and then they ran a bunch of crazy experiments on them. Um, they put some magnetic coils next to the microscope, and they turned them on, and the Euglena got confused. Um, and would they, they couldn't um, function normally, basically, um, because they must have some sort of magnetic um, direction sense, which is pretty crazy. 
and they were watching the um, Euglena colonies, what they would do is they would go out and they would collect resources and they'd start to bring them all back to a central location. Like the community would go collect the resources together. And if one of them was like dragging something and it was struggling, another one would come and they would work together to pull them towards, um, uh, they would pull them towards a central location like they were building something. It was incredibly interesting. <laughs> like during wartime, the live version. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, and uh, they did all kinds of really interesting experiments on them. It made me like, um, I mean, they're just incredibly interesting organisms. Um, uh, but they also did some experiments where they um, they put them in. Uh, whoop, that guy's really zooming around. Uh, they put them in UVC. Uh, light and UVB light and UVA so all types of ultraviolet radiation and uh, Good news, everyone. Uh, some of those kinds will just flat out kill you if you were exposed to them as a human um, and they're blocked largely by things like ozone in the upper atmosphere and uh, uh, you could just leave it on them for hours and they didn't care no effect on them like the hardest UV light you could dump onto them did not bother the Euglena at all. I mean, it's incredible. And they were studying them in part because uh, they always try to, to tie these kinds of um, records into um, uh, like looking for extraterrestrial life to try to both pull things back to Enceladosaurus a little bit. Um, they, they try to pull these things in as um, organisms that can handle these extreme conditions because they basically would be the kinds of ex uh, conditions that you'd be put in outer space, you know, exposed to really high levels of radiation and um, really um, potentially acidic conditions or um, dry conditions, like on and off. Anyway. <laughs> This stream is perfect reason to ignore finishing this stack of reviews. Yeah, don't uh, do not do any reviews. Those can't be good for anybody. Uh, how do they do that thinking as single-celled organisms? Without, I have no idea, Simon. I, I was just like, I don't get this. They're the tiny little organisms with no brain. Somehow working together. Um... Maybe they can communicate chemically. They have no idea. They could, we could not figure it out. <laughs> you just listened to this, this must be the place? It's a good one. I like it. I do like life in a wartime too, but... Uh, uh, what is a sample on my microscope? Or more appropriately, where did my sample come from? Uh, it came from about um, 10 feet that direction. Out the window is my koi pond. And in my backyard and um, uh, the samples from my backyard basically I, I put a lot of time into preparing for the sample um, I went out there with a, uh, a ladle and I just scraped the side of my koi pond into this bowl and then uh, squeeze some of it onto a cover slip and here we are um, I did have to carry the microscope from that desk to this one and plug it in. Uh, that was basically it. Um, I do get samples from parks around here. Um, if you're asking us, so if somebody asked what is this, um, hang on, I've got a little arrow. Oh, it's down here. I forgot to turn it off. Uh, this thing right here is a diatom, and this thing right here, also a diatom, and that thing out there, also a diatom. These are all diatoms, and they belong to the genus Gomphonema. And uh, I've looked at these in the SEM as well as the light microscope through process samples. And um, I think this Gomphonema is something you can find on um, Diatoms of North America. Um, if you went there and looked under Gomphonema, um, I don't remember the name of it off the top of my head. 
I had a stream where we looked at it in the SEM, just a sample from my koi pond we stuck on the SEM um, in the fall. And then it had been like a couple of months from that, uh, oh, Johnson I, company with Johnson I. Um, it had been a couple of months from that uh, stream, then uh, my student uh, lab technician, Mallory, uh, tried to trick me. She wanted to put like a random SEM stub on the SEM and then see if I could figure out what it was based on the diatoms. And she picked the one from my koi pond and put it on there. And then uh, I asked her how long I had to wait before I could guess, because it went on there and I was like, this is a sample from my koi pond. And she's like, how did you know? I was like, this diatom. And it was in, in my koi pond. So, uh, is it an insect? I haven't seen any insects today. Um, that thing that's in the background, I don't know what you're talking about precisely, but if you mean this thing, uh, I don't think that's an insect. Um, these little things that are attached, this is Cladophora, it's a type of green algae. And these little things that are attached to it are tiny diatoms. And then this big thing that's attached to it is a big diatom, well, medium-sized diatom. That's about uh, 50, 40 or 50 microns across. So you can see there's a scale bar over here hiding. It's correctly scaled at the moment. Um, I don't think I've seen any insects so far tonight. Um, we sometimes get insect larvae. And I do have insects that are in my pond. You can see here's a whole bunch of crazy diatoms living on. See how they're all attached? This is the in, it's like a little forest of diatom valves. Every one of these little guys that you see that's club shaped, it's called clavate, these ones, those are Gomphonema johnsoni, every one of them. Uh, and they're all the same diatom, basically, and it it uh, it's like a culture in my in my koi pond back there. <laughs> same species. Uh, no, no, the Clodophora can have more than eight. Uh, it's only Cenodesmus that's required to be eight or fewer. Uh, other algae are fine. Um, Clodophora. like that by the way. Um, the Cladophora uh, can have as many segments. They actually make really really long, uh, they grow into really really long things. Sunodesmus is like that. So it's helpful if you can google stuff if you want to you know like learn more about it. Or, I mean I guess I told you pretty much all I know about them. <laughs> um, but What exactly is a diatom? Oh, I have that answered right here. You don't have to kick a hornet's nest, it's just... Oh wait. Sorry. I should do it so it's both commands because I always forget that there's an S on the end. They're a type of algae. Um, they're the most benevolent of the algae, actually. They almost never make toxins. There's just one genus that's um, in the marine realm that we know of that makes toxins that are dangerous uh, to people or organisms. And they're pretty um, limited to just uh, estuary and environments. And most of the time they're just out making oxygen, doing their thing. And they're the primary food source for basically everything that eats in aquatic environments because they're autotrophic. They make their own food out of sunlight, like trees. They also generate a crap ton of oxygen in our environment. Good news, so, everyone. Um, one of the most... Um, benevolent organisms you can think of, and they primarily clone themselves to grow. So they do a lot of um, uh, laying around and growing on things, and then getting eaten by snails, and rotifers, and uh, um, protozoa, um, pretty much anything in the water will eat a diatoma if it fits into their mouths. And their solution for defying being eaten is to just get ahead, go ahead and be eaten most of the time. Um, but they replicate so quickly that they just don't care. So um, from the perspective of like um, superheroes, diatoms are kind of like Swamp Thing. 
Like, you can news, keep everyone. trying to kill them, all you'll get is, you know, like, uh, them regrowing faster than you can kill them. That's their strategy. Uh, in ecology, we refer to that as um, R strategy, R type strategy. Uh, instead of K type, capacity type strategy, it means they have really high reproduction rates. And in diatoms, they clone themselves most of the time. So most of their growth is done through asexual reproduction. Just just binary fission for the most part. They like an amoeba, except for diatoms could potentially replicate, um, you know, under the best conditions, something like eight times in a day. And each one of those could replicate as well. So like most algae, they can create these massive blooms uh, pretty quickly. That is Euploides, a type of ciliate. A little predator, he just ate something. Just walking around eating bacteria, he just got some more. On the front end of their um, heads, the, the head end basically, the anterior end, they have little hairs that they're wiggling around right now, and uh, they pull, pull the water towards them, basically, when they do that. Um, and it pulls food towards their mouths while they're at it. Yeah, R-type. If we were to scrape a sample from my school's aquaponic system, I would be likely to find some diatoms. Uh, is it, if it has light and nutrients, then the answer is yes. Diatoms are probably growing there. Doesn't matter what it is or where it is. Um, you can get diatoms growing in soil. So even in the most like places you don't even think of as being aquatic systems, they grow in oceans, rivers, lakes. Um, they grow in tree bark, mosses, uh, lichen, um, the sides of buildings, cave walls, uh, rocks outside the water. Um, but they have to have at least some moisture occasionally, and they need sunlight, and then they need uh, typically silica, phosphorus, and nitrogen. Um, if your system doesn't have any silica, or just has very limited amounts of silica, you probably won't get diatoms, you'll probably get something else. But if you have a little bit of silica in your, um, your fish tank, for example, which probably is in there, whether you know it or not, because it's probably just dissolved in the water, um, then you will likely get diatoms growing in your fish tank as well. And if you're wondering how did they get there, um, they're in the food that they make for, I think, for most of the fish, and uh, or they get transferred in by the organisms themselves, and then they will just take over and culture. If you have your fish tank in the sun, it will have diatoms growing all over it. Yeah, a lot of nutrients. So you probably would get them. The critter that is a microscopic vacuum, uh, it's not a diatom. This is Euploides. This thing right here is a type of ciliate. And you can see the cilia all the way around its body. This is a predator. It eats diatoms and bacteria, anything that'll fit in its mouth. You see it's moving around and it's sucking things towards its face. Occasionally something will hit it and it'll start going backwards, but um, the rest of the stuff is actually going into its mouth and uh, it's consuming it. So it's actually a predator. Um, is the silica gel made of the same materials uh, that the diatoms eat. Silica gels, most of the time that you find, are made from diatoms or diatomaceous earth, which is basically just a high concentration of the skeletons of diatoms. So, How do they subdivide with their silica shells? Um, you know, I have some uh, great graphics for that that are not on here as figures. Um, It's a really good question, though. 
Um, open as a new tab. There. I'm just going to paste this into the chat window. Um, I could put it on the screen, but um, I'm, I just, it's, it'll take up the whole screen. So, um, but the general idea is that diatoms will form one valve inside of another valve. So um, if we think of, I usually have something that I can use as a, So the skeletons of diatoms cell walls would be, if we had one of the round ones, it would look something like this. The two valves fit together, but one of them's just a little bit bigger than the other. Like this lid fits on top of this one. And they have girdle bands that wrap around the outside and holds the two halves of the valve together. What they'll do is, when they go to reproduce asexually, is they'll create space between the two valves and they have more girdle bands they wrap around the outside so that they just get enlarged like this. And then they will make a new diatom valve inside of this one and another one inside of this one. And of course, this one will be roughly the same size as the original. Girdle bands will be wrapped around it. And then this one will have a diatom valve that's inside of the inside lip of this one. So a little bit smaller than the original lid and when they replicate, each time they replicate, they get smaller and smaller. One half of the population gets smaller and smaller when it replicates, and the other one basically stays the same size. And you end up with two diatoms formed from the same diatom parent, and then one half of the population just it stays the same size all the time. It's the larger, the red cap, and then the one that formed from this will always be smaller, and then the valve that's inside of this when it replicates it will make a smaller one so one half of population is always getting smaller and then this uh, one that stayed the same size can replicate something like 28 times before it um, can no longer replicate they basically just sort of burn burn out um, their ability to replicate and um, it will uh, just perish so eventually the population gets smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller as a cohort. And then they reach a certain size threshold. And then there's an environmental cue that will happen. Like maybe they need a little bit of extra salinity or something like that. And then uh, they'll switch to sexual reproduction. And the diatoms, half the population will split open. Gametes will come out and effectively like sperm will go find other diatoms and will impregnate them in a giant sort of orgy in the water. And, um, and then the populations basically will uh, start over at the largest size fraction and become smaller and smaller as they subdivide again. So they have this really interesting um, repeating cycle of being little, getting littler and littler as a population and then switching to sexual reproduction, getting back to the maximum size and then start over with replication. So um, this little guy's a gastro trick, by the way, if you don't know. So um, we saw one of these earlier, we were following it around for quite a while. Um, it looks like a slug, but it's actually a, um, a gastro trick. It's its own thing, um, special organism. So um, that's basically how they subdivide. Things for used for repelling ants is actually related. Yeah, it's the skeletons of fossil diatoms that are used in um, in uh, in diatomaceous earth. Basically, it's just diatomite, which is a rock made out of diatoms, and they crush it uh, to make the diatomaceous earth. In fact, I have some in the basement. And occasionally we uh, just take a little bit of it and pinch a bit and put it on the slide, and it's all full of diatom valves. So um, ancient diatom valves, 10 million year old diatom valves, actually, for the most part. Good news, everyone. Thank you for the follow. Um, Saiming, how long do diatoms live if nothing eats them? Um, generally speaking, um, 
it depends on whether they're planktic or benthic, and it's probably species dependent. But I'd say on average, a typical diatom cell, this is different than the organism because they're clones, um, an individual cell probably lives about um, a month or two if it doesn't fall out of the water column or get eaten by something or whatever. Um, that's an individual cell, so maybe a month, maybe two months. Um, maybe some of the benthic cells last a little bit longer than that, but it's pretty short. And um, the reason I wanted to specify that it's a cell I'm talking about is because organisms that can clone themselves um, and can undergo binary fission are effectively eternal. Um, if you think about a typical amoeba, for example, um, you have one amoeba and then it eats a bunch of stuff, right? And then it grows and then it gets big enough to decide to split and then you have two amoebas. Which one's the old one? Both of them. Which one's the young one? Both of them. So then that amoeba grows, and then it splits, and then there's four amoeba. Which one's the young one? Both of them. Which one's the old one? Both of them. They live forever. They will just keep splitting and growing and splitting and growing. Diatoms will do the same thing. So if you're thinking about them as an organism, it's hard because they don't have ages. Um, they might go five years between sexual cycles. So just cloning themselves for five years in a row, each one of those cells basically living for a couple of months. Um, and then, you know, they'll undergo sexual reproduction, but like, which one of the organisms is living or dying, right? It's a really problematic model for our concept of aging. That's the only thing I know about diatoms. It's crazy what it does to insects. Yeah, they're just like uh, little broken diatom frustules. And um, they're like broken glass, basically. It's like walking across a bunch of broken glass. They, um, they damage and cut the organisms because they're small enough, basically, to act like razor blades or razor wire or something like that, right? Um, so that's really problematic if you're little. So this is, the while it's sitting here, it's giving us plenty of good looks at the little cilia. This is DIC lighting, which is what makes this microscope so expensive. And I can turn down the contrast, and um, you can see what it looks like. It's basically just transmitted, but when I turn the contrast up, it gives it a really dark outline like that. And I can also play with... Oops, sorry, this is going to take my camera a minute to adjust to unless I do this. Um, I can switch this over. So I'm opening up the diaphragm right now on the camera. And it actually reduces the relief. So now it looks like... This is what it would look like in your... Um, hang on, I can make it worse. I'm going to make it worse. I'm going to make it look like the way it looks in everybody else's microscope. Uh... Let's see, they, they can turn this thing up so you'd still get that. Uh, but they, you can't get this. Sorry, that's me again. So it would look like this in somebody else's microscope. <laughs> um, a little fuzzy. I guess I could try to pull this out. It might help. Sorry, I did that thing again. Every time I change the light, I need to be backed out for my camera. That's kind of how it would look like in most people's microscopes. Um, under good conditions. I guess I could take this thing out. That's what it would look like on a typical microscope. Uh, so not great. Uh, this is with everything pulled out, all the filters, uh, and um, this is the polarizer. This is the analyzer. This is the DIC contrast. Uh, lens and then uh, I can turn up the contrast if I put it on to the filter that it goes with and uh, this is all my camera doing this part let's 
the DIC lighting. <laughs> um, so just to give you an idea of like why my camera and my microscope are so expensive. Um, not to get too heavy in such a cool, relaxed chat, but uh, geeking out a second, I wonder given the red algal plastids taken up by some diatoms, how many endosymbiotic gene transfer events are in their genome? Um, do you know there's, um, uh, there's endosymbiotic diatoms that have a, um, sorry, there's both diatoms that have endosymbiotic relationships with um, cyanobacteria so pretty much everything that belongs in the epithemia genus, Ropolodia epithemia genus, has endosymbiotic relationship with nitrogen-fixing bacteria, which are cyanobacteria. And, um, and then there are some weird organisms that actually have diatoms as part of their endosymbiosis, so diatoms are living inside of them um, as, I don't remember what they are, I think it's, Forams, yeah, I think there's there's diatoms that live inside of forams. Um, so I'm I imagine there's some gene transfer that goes on there. Um, I'm, this is you're outside of my realm a little bit there. Study. Um, I look at the hard parts of diatoms for the most part, and I do ecology. And when people start asking questions about gene stuff, I usually am like, I don't know, because I don't. Um, but it's okay not to know things. That's that's my uh, opinion about it. Not knowing things is what makes life interesting. Um, we can't know everything. Well, I can't know everything. Let me put it that way. But um, most of my focus is not in that uh, that realm. So um, I can't get too heavy because I don't know the answers to those questions very well. Um, I do have uh, colleagues who study diatom genetics, quite a few. Um, they don't stream, but um, I could probably convince one of them to come on here. And then I'll line them up and you can ask all the hard questions about genetics for them. And uh, I'll act like I wasn't expecting it. <laughs> hey, it's a Ritifer. I'll be like, hey, I don't know where they got these questions from. You can see it's little Corona spinning around at the top there. So we can switch, let's see, if I, this is what we've been using as the 10x objective. That's the 20x objective, which actually looks better, um, in my opinion, but the focal depth is a little bit smaller. And um, I need to make some adjustments to the light. There we go. And now when we zoom in, we're really zoomed in. But you can see all kinds of crazy detail now. Now I'm showing off. Uh, if you really want to see what the scope can do, I need to put it on the, the thousand X objective with the DIC lighting. But um, these things won't show up as anything besides blobs at that level, so. You don't need to have uh, the expensive microscope to see things. You just need to have it to make them look this nice. Um, you can still see them without the expensive microscopes. Making things bigger is not actually the problem. Um, and in fact, most of the things that we're looking at, we've been looking at it in 10x, which is like, you know, 100x magnification with the eyepieces. It's not asking a lot 
of any microscope to give you a 10x objective. Um, or even this one, this is only a 20x objective, so we're only up to 200 times. Oops, I should fix that though. Because its skill bar is wrong. We are 20 by 3. That's our actual skill bar. So that's a, a 100 micron scale bar. Just give you an idea of roughly how big we are. Yeah, the yellow is uh, things it's been eating. Those are diatoms and green algae that it's been consuming and other algae that it's been consuming. It's the chloroplasts of other organisms. <laughs> you work in molecular evolution, yeah. Um, it's just a little outside of my realm study. I mean, I do look at, now you can really see all the diatoms it's, it's looking like it's grazing on. Do you see all those diatoms that it's like poking around at right there? It's like, hmm, maybe I'll eat some of these. They're not going anywhere. Smash my face in there and see if I can rip some diatoms off. Um, those little tiny diatoms that are all living like, they're like, uh, it's like a forest of suckers for it. It's like, I'll take some of those. These look delicious. <laughs> that was a cool question. It made me learn about endobiotic symbi endosymbiotic relationships. Yeah, uh, I know a little bit about uh, endosymbiotic relationships. I'm, uh, it's just not my primary study area, so. Um, when it comes to the questions about genetic stuff and biology and, and physiology stuff, I usually just punt. <laughs> like, sorry. <laughs> I look at the hard parts, um, I mean, I'm, uh, those are its eyes basically, that uh, you can see on there, those like glowing orange spots that are in the middle of its body, um, I don't know if I will stay long enough for me to point to them, gotta get my, so much to do before it moves, these ones are the eyes, right there. And that's the mastax, which is basically like its jaw, and that's its uh, intestinal trackway. You can see it's got a foot with little toes that it uses to grip things, and then it got off the screen. Um, the rotifers Good news, have a, uh, a corona, which is the name of the um, cilia that are around the top of its mouth up there. So it looks like it has a mustache. and. Uh, that's actually what it uses to pull food towards its mouth. And then you can see when it's eating, you'll actually see the mastex start to move like it's crunching its jaws. It, people sometimes think it's its heart, but it's actually the mastex that you're seeing right there usually. It's sort of that yellow thing below the eyes on its body. And then yeah, that's its stomach. But they're translucent, right? So you're seeing everything they eat. look like it's getting that much in um, and then you can actually see it's got like a little uh, there's occasionally because it's on the other side of it you'll see that little thing sticking off the top of its head sorry right there it had a little like unicorn horn sticking off the top of its head that's its uh, antenna it's basically how it senses things that it can't see so This looks really good at 20x, actually. Well, I think it does anyway. Um, it's on a cover slip, so I could actually take it up to 40x, but um, the higher the magnification goes up, the lower the depth of field gets, and then I'm really relying on the relief here uh, quite a bit by the, the uh, changing the diaphragm. There's another little ciliate right there probably wouldn't have even seen that guy at 10x. Oh, there he goes. He's like, don't look at me. I didn't say you guys could look at me. That's the way they move. They just teleport. 
Those really little squiggly things you see, that's bacteria. These things, those are all like little bacterial cells probably. Uh, Jiggly, it's attaching its foot to the cover slip part of the time, and then when it has other objects, it will pick those. Um, but the glass that's, you know, the slide above and below, it can actually attach itself to those. And see that little guy reaching around in front of him? Another little, um, those are called uh, heterotrophic nanoflagellates little tiny guys, like cryptomonads and things like that. This guy also has a flagella. I think that one's autotrophic though. <laughs> the stream is confirmed. I need to buy a microscope I barely know how to use. Well, um, the best way to learn how to use a microscope is to use it a lot. And, um, and then ask people who know how to use a microscope what to do. So, um, you know, I learned from basically just watching people and doing it myself until something looked good. And then I was like, oh, but um, if it helps, you could always ask questions. I'm happy to help. Um, this is probably not the microscope you wanna buy unless you, um, Unless you have a spare $20,000 laying around, or you work in a lab that can afford to buy you a microscope, at which point, go ahead. Um, there you can see the bacteria. That's actually kind of an amazing view. It's a little bright. Let's see if I can make an adjustment here. It's amazing how small this stuff is. All those little things that are sort of barely visible little bubbles are bacteria. And you can see one of those little uh, cryptomonad things here sniffing around. <laughs> um, and then these things are probably diatoms, all of them. I guess there might be some other types of uh, green green algae or something here that are making this little pair fight in forest um, but these things that's all bacteria in there and that's a dead cell and they're just chewing away at all of this stuff eating all of the organic material which is what they do thankfully it's what they do um, those are dead cells that are just floating kind of a cool looking floating cell These are, uh, I think those are all diatoms. Good news, everyone! Thank you for the follow. G. Catulo. Internal academic laughs at a spare. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, they're not gonna be bothered by 20,000. And then, uh,. That's not much money. Oh, that guy's zooming around. Okay, we're gonna zoom out. The, the startup money, uh, 20,000 is nothing. Look at this crazy strand of Clodophora with diatoms just growing all along the length of it. It's ridiculous. They're on every surface in here. Hey, there's our boy. That's well, actually a girl. Uh, I know that because that's a deloid order for, and they only have girls. Only females. It's a unisex group of rotifers. The deloid are only female. 
Auckland. They don't have sex. Just this group. Olivia's? Oh, my niece is here. I haven't seen you on Twitch in a really long time, Olivia. I was actually talking about the fact that I lent you my camera. Um, at the beginning of the semester. And then I haven't seen you streaming anything. Um, I've been waiting for you to come back. Uh, the coolest thing I've ever seen was probably a couple streams ago for like living organisms like this. Uh, we saw these things called Lacrimaria. Um, they're like little, they're called swan's tears. They're, they're like a little uh, teardrop shaped thing. And then they have a very long neck. And the neck just goes out and gets food and it's super stretchy like a rubber band. It will go way away from its body and go get food and then come back. And when it swallowed some things, it will just, uh, you'll see it move down the neck tube to the body. It's, they're absolutely fascinating. And uh, there were two of them, they were side by side. They look like um, spaghetti noodles that were like, you know, like moving around. <laughs> it makes for great job interviews. Oh, I forgot you, uh, you, you, um, oh, this guy finally started putting out its actual like feeding apparatus. Here we go. This guy's been mostly snorf snorfling around for food, and it finally decided to camp out a place. Oh, that was a little too slow. Well, you might have saw it. Um, when they bring out their actual feeding apparatus, you'll start to see, there it is. Now they're feeding. It's got the corona completely out right there. And now it's eating. So when they decide to eat, they turn the jets on, and now you can see the little mass stack is moving. And there's its antenna and it's repositioned itself a little bit. Uh, is the VOD for the stream I'm referring to available? Yes. Yeah, like saw blades. Um, it absolutely is uh, available on Twitch still. It was just like um, a week ago, maybe two weeks ago. I'll see if I can find it. Should it should be some clips of it actually. Um, but it just was fascinating to watch them. We just sat and watched them for like, I don't know, an hour of us watching this one thing. Uh, but it was worth it. <laughs> um, their heads just And somebody asked me a question in that stream. They said, oh, if they get decapitated, will their heads grow back? And I was like, I don't think so. But then I looked it up later and they can. If they get decapitated, their heads will grow back. Uh, in actually less than like an hour or something, their head will completely grow back. <laughs> uh, which I guess is important because I think they leave their body stashed away someplace and then they just throw their head out there to go get the food. Yeah, it was amazing to watch. Um, you know, way worth it. So you're doing job interviews now? You're done with school? Are you almost done with school? And, uh... And now you're going to get rich doing whatever it is you're going to do, Olivia. It's going to get ready. Get ready. There they go. Yeah. It turned on its food eating. If this thing was the size of like a dog or a wolf, get out. You'd just freak out when you saw this thing climbing around the clawed foot and then pulled out a bunch of saw blades out of its head. Two more weeks. Okay, good luck. And then you're going to graduate. <laughs> Graboid. Hey, Ask a Scientist, how's it going? Uh, yeah, the rotifers are pretty amazing when they start spinning their uh, actual corona. Uh, I try to pull the food in. I mean, they're kind of amazing when they're not. But I think once they start pulling out the feeding apparatus, then they're really fascinating to watch. It's like its head goes and unfolds into a series of like saw blades. <laughs> yeah, yeah, if it was scaled up, you'd freak out. You wouldn't, you'd totally freak out if you saw this thing scaled up to full size. You'd be like, every one of these things, you'd be freaked out. It's like, oh. There's a floating blob with a mustache. 
that's just eating everything in front of it. I really need to work on that mustache. Uh, I'm gonna, that's gonna be my next thing. I don't have a whole lot to do for the week, so I'm gonna get a mustache gif, I'm gonna put it in here, and then uh, I'm gonna make it so that uh, whatever's on the screen, you can spend your channel points and I'll put a mustache on it. It would be great. And maybe even a full beard for some of them. I'll just scale it to whatever it is. Including my guests if I'm doing an interview, maybe. You never know. Everything looks better with a mustache. Uh, do you something contract like that? Sorry. Do you use actin myosin to contract like that? Or is it totally, I don't know. Uh, Saturnite, <laughs> you love mustache on aliens. Uh, I don't know how they pull themselves in and out, if they're using muscles uh, or what, you know, what exactly they, again, that's a biology question and I'm not a, I don't look at the soft parts of things. I mean, I'm looking at them now, but uh, I'm just like you guys. I don't know what's going on most of the time. I know the names of parts, and I kind of know a lot about uh, Deloid Rotifer's evolution, but uh, I don't know anything about their, like, <sighs> beats me how they do all this stuff. <laughs> Come on, flip your head open. Nope. I feel like when we went up to the 20x, life just changed a little bit. Zoom! Once we got into that 20x zone, it's like, I don't know if I can go back. I think we're stuck on 20x for the rest of the stream. We're zoomed in, and now we're really going to stay that way for a while. It looks pretty here. It's a good looking level. Oh, hello! Hello! What are you up to? Little flagella. So it moves slow enough I could actually stop and drink. Almost. Maybe if I didn't talk about it. Ten thirty. Okay. I need to uh, uh, point out again that um, Pacific Plankton is streaming at uh, in an hour and a half. So a half hour is eleven. One hour and a half is twelve. And um, she's going to be looking at live Plankton from San Francisco Bay, and we are buddies and have been streaming together and hanging out, um, sharing samples. Earlier today, um, I was looking at some of her materials on the SEM, and uh, she's my moderator and I'm her moderator, so we do good teamwork. And I'm gonna be on there as a disembodied voice, which is okay, because I think she's most of the time a disembodied voice on her own channel. Um, so you won't be able to tell that much, but it's a great stream, one of my favorite streams on Twitch, and, uh, we'll be hanging out, doing science together, looking at sciencey things, and if you wanted to catch the SEM stream from earlier today that I did where I was looking at our samples, it should be up on Twitch soon, or if it isn't already. Probably worth it. Check out. Ooh, what did we find? What did this guy lead us to? Hello, creepy thing. What are you? You guys see that thing, right? You see all of his crazy little tentacles sticking out? I think those are cilia. And I believe what we're looking at is a heliozoan. 
which is a type of protozoa uh, that looks like a sun, basically. They have a round body and then a bunch of cilia that stick out from the center. It's not exciting in that it's moving, but it's pretty exciting to be able to see it at this scale. Plus it's not moving, so I can take a second and look around at what's going on. It's a lot easier to chase things that don't move. guy that's next to it right there. It's a ciliate. No, a flagellate. It's got little flagellates poking around with. It's like it's getting taller and taller. It's stretching out its ciliate, or its flagella. Alright, let's zoom back out. Let's go find... Uh-oh. I know what that is. That is our air bubble closing in. Uh-oh, it's closing in on our rotifer. You're in a bad place, bub. Lady, you need to move. You need to move. Air bubbles are bad. You can't fight the air bubble. Fortunately, she could turn on her jets and zoom away from here. This other little guy? He's stuck. The slide's been on for a little too long. Now my sample's starting to dry up. I probably need to move it before the slide pressure, the cover slip pressure will start to get very high on this end of the slide and it will squeeze them. I would like to return them to the pond when we are done with them so that we don't have to harm any of these organisms. And because it's my... What the... What the heck? Ah, it's a nematode. I think I want to go this way. What's up, Wednesday? You want to look in the microscope? <laughs> yeah, this is the front end, Saturn. <laughs> What's going on, Wednesday? Hmm? Hmm? You want to be cute for Twitch? in the microscope. In there? Oh my goodness. You just wanted to treat, you didn't even want to get up here. That'll teach you to get close to me while I'm streaming. All right, I'm going to switch to a new slide because uh, I don't want anything in here to get squeezed to death. If we can help it. Good news, everyone! <laughs> yeah, that's Wednesday. She's, uh... She does a little trill. She wanders around the house going brr, 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 until 
somebody gives her treats. Maybe doing a little surgery over here on the last slide. Try to preserve everything in it. I can switch this over to the next one. A new fresh slide without any impending air bubbles. At least for a little while. Sorry about the blinding light. see what else we can find that lives in my pond in the backyard. A bunch of little guys kind of rolling around in here. Let's go. Yeah, there we go. There's a whole bunch of Vorticella. There's some rotifers. All just kind of hanging out. It's a good sign. Oh, I found a worm. Uh, I think these are called Nide worms. Nided. It's it's stuck a little bit, which is making it easier for us to see it. Uh oh, it detached itself. It's no longer stuck. Oh no, it's still stuck. It's stuck here on the butt end. Right there. It's like little hairs are stuck on stuff. can see it you know people are used to thinking of worms as having segmented bodies you can see it has like little rows of hairs along one or two of the segments that are sticking out those hairs are like sticking out way outside of its body out here What are you doing, Wednesday? Just got like one paw on me under there. Whole bunch of diatoms and vorticella.
<laughs> it looks like a Roomba. They are a little bit like little Roombas. They are sweeping up things into their mouths. Um, anytime anybody says Roomba to me though, I immediately start thinking my sister, your Aunt Mel, and their Roomba that uh, ran over the dog poop. Uh, no, the dog had diarrhea and the Roomba went over the diarrhea and then carried it through the rest of the entire house. I don't know. You remember that story, I'm sure. Saturn, I did some research, and rotiform muscles are classified as skeletal muscles as they connect to different segments of their skeleton. So yes, their movement is muscle-driven. All right. <laughs> I do remember that story. My sister had a... They did away with the Roomba after that, I think. I think they got rid of it because they couldn't salvage it. It was just like, that's got to go in the trash. <laughs> that Roomba is loaded with turds and it's going in the trash. You can see all the stuff this thing is spinning towards its mouth over here. <laughs> it's spinning its sword for loot. Uh, that's just something caught in the gyre. I guess it could be spinning its sword for loot, though. It does seem fair. Uh, anything's possible. There's something crawling around in the back here that I can't... It won't come out. Oh, here's a vorticella that got detached. I wonder if we can follow it. This little guy? I need to go out one click, out one click, out one click. This little guy. He's, um... Whoa, there it goes! It's not fully attached. It's loose. I don't think it's caught completely on the back end. If it breaks out of that pile of junk, it's just gonna go like a helium balloon. Like, uh, for these, where's the mouth? Um, so that's how it attaches, and it just uses this. Basically, it can pull itself up and down on this thing. You see it coil when it lets loose. Uh, and then up around here, it's like a bell-shaped organism. That's most of its body right here. And all of its organs and everything are in here. And its mouth opening is up here. So it spins this stuff around like crazy. It's not actually spinning them, it's just waving them. And it causes the water to move towards its mouth. And um, like an airplane propeller, basically. Sorry. Uh, you can see the gyre it's creating and it does that so that the food particles get pulled right towards the center which is where its mouth is and then some stuff goes in basically it can reject particles as well but some goes into the mouth and they're doing all that just by waving little hairs <laughs> you saw the game the other day ah oh, that spinning worm oh man those worms are dangerous um, but I think I only died from objects that ran me over. Oh, wait. One of them was like, uh... Oh, it got detached and it took off. Um... One of those, uh... Oh, here's a whole bunch of vorticella out on their own. There they are. Very pretty. Um... I got run over by a tumbleweed and like a boulder and like I fell one time. It's like the things that were attacking me didn't kill me. I don't, maybe something did get me once, but all, almost all of my deaths were like objects that I bumped into or, I mean, I guess the tumbleweed counts as an organism, but it hit me once. Um, and I hadn't really played Terraria very much, so um, that's a fun game. It's a lot of fun. 
um, it's like Minecraft but 2D. I mean, more 2D, like uh, platformy 2D gaming, like 8 bit gaming. Um, I played it when I was, like, when it first came out, my friends all had it and they were playing it, and I was like, what's this? And I started playing it, and I think one of those worms killed me. And, uh, and I was like, this game sucks. <laughs> like, <laughs> I had no sense of humor about. Uh, getting hit once by a worm and dying. I was like, this is not fun. That thing killed me with one hit. Uh, and I don't know that I ever went back and played it again. Um, and I don't know why. I guess I had a bad attitude about gaming. But I wasn't really into like platform gaming. I still am not really. Um, like, uh, I say that, but um, if you look on like the games I've played the most on Steam, it's probably like uh, Meat Boy, Super Meat Boy, which is like a platform game. Um, but it's one of those like punishing platform games where you kind of have to do things over and over and over again until you get it right. Um, those ones I kind of like. Uh, I don't know why, but uh, Super Meat Boy I really liked. Uh, as I was a crazy fun game um, it's a, sort of like a puzzle though more than anything else I guess they all are in a way okay, I keep going this way and I keep wanting to go this way to this giant mass over here oh my gosh it's all vorticella there's one that's detached it's just spinning it's going nuts. It's lost the rudder. Just <laughs> I sound way too chill to be a Super Meat Boy fan. Um flipped over. Look at it flipping over. Very cool. I was like, why does it keep going out of focus? Uh, there's too much 3D space for the... There. We got to see it in three dimensions for a minute there while I was flipping. Um, I don't know. I, there's a bunch of games I kind of like. Why are there so many spinning things at this scale? Well, silly is a good strategy because it's a very fast movement for organisms. And um, I think also they don't have any like sense of balance, so it's, there's no punishment for just spinning yourself around like crazy. Um, but I don't know the answer to that question. And look at all these little guys in here, it's just nuts. Um, you know, diatoms aren't spinners, they're just crawlers. They don't do any spinning. And the ones that, I mean, Generally speaking, most of them don't even crawl, or roughly half of them don't crawl. Hmm. Not sure what that brown thing is. It's like an insect carapace. Maybe there are some insects in my pond. Uh, there are uh, water striders in my pond. And I have no idea how they get there. Uh, they must fly? I don't know. I get really confused by that. Like, like how did water striders get from one place to another? Because they're not there in the winter time, right? And then in the summer, they're all over the surface. I think they must fly short distances. They must have like a winged phase. But I thought that was super confusing to me. Like how does something that just walks on water get from one pond to another? <laughs> how does that happen? Uh, I mean, I suppose they could just be transformed, trans uh, transferred by bird wings and whatever else things that diatoms get carried around by, but 
seems like it's a more eminent strategy for insects. I mean, they need to resolve it a lot faster because they need to colonize those environments very quickly. I'm not sure what this guy's doing. It's kind of... Snorfling. like something around here is going to fit in my mouth. I'm just going to keep looking. I'm just going to crawl up and down this little bit of stem until something goes in. Oh, maybe it's snacking on diatoms. Yeah, it's a uh, um it's from my koi pond. I love the idea of Roomba, but I can't use it because my dog thinks it's a Terminator and tries to destroy it every time. You know, um, uh, we lost our dog back in in um, in November, but um, a lot of the dogs that I've had, they don't like vacuum cleaners on any level. Um, and pretty much every dog we've ever had just goes nuts when there's a vacuum cleaner on, starts trying to bite it and stuff. Uh, they just, something about a vacuum cleaner kind of drives a dog crazy. And the idea of one that's moving around on its own probably is way worse. Yeah, I really don't know what's going on there. I think maybe it's a coronamid skeleton. Or a molt. There's a lot of hair looks like an insect something or other like an insect and there's this little guy climbing up and down the uh... there he is that's a ciliate he looks good at 20x He's just hanging out spinning Yeah, it's uh, it's water from my koi pond. Yeah, you think they can fly ferox? I'm I'm sure they must be able to, but they don't seem like they would be very good at it. So, um, anyway, getting back to games I play, I play a lot of weird stuff that I like, just whatever. So for a long time, I played Team Fortress Two and you know Warcraft Three, and now I just do a bunch of Sudoku basically, and play puzzle games. Some of my, uh, some of the people in my, um, regulars in my stream have been playing Apex in my, uh, streaming it into my Discord channel, trying to talk me into playing that. And I watch people play it a lot, so, you know, it's just not my... Shooting games are not in my wheelhouse most of the time. There's usually somebody out there that's so much better than me that's playing like on a Smurf account so they can beat up on people. I guess because they don't want anybody else to have fun. These little guys are just turning their little Roomba brushes very slowly. That one in the background is loose. presence of certain microorganisms indicative of good or bad water quality? Yes. Um, in fact, that's one of the primary, I mean, I study diatoms, as you know, but that's one of the primary ways that diatoms are utilized in modern environments. People look at the types of diatoms to look at things like nutrient pollution or water quality. Um, but actually, it's not just limited to algae. Uh, and in fact, there's a greater emphasis usually placed on 
aquatic invertebrates, in particular the um, the aquatic insects. So um, I don't know how much you know about uh, insects, but there's a large f fraction of the um, flying insects, the things that are flies, that start off underwater. So dragonflies start off underwater, for example. They live in water for many years as a larva before they turn into a dragonfly. But mayflies, blackflies, craneflies, um, caddisflies, they all start off as an aquatic phase, and um, people often use those as water quality indicators. Um, and there's a wide range of different kinds of aquatic insects that can be utilized for aquatic, for determining like oxygen levels and water quality, um, in part because of what they eat, but in part because they have higher or lower oxygen demands. And so people usually news, link, everyone. thanks our lect, um, the, uh, the people usually link oxygen levels with water quality because they're primarily concerned about fish because everybody cares about fish. Nobody cares about algae and nobody cares about zooplankton or phytoplankton. They care about the fish. Um, and you know, no one even cares about aquatic insects or, or protozoa or metazoa. Um, what they want to know is like high quality fish, right? Cause that's where all the money is for states and for resources for people. And you know, larger organisms always have a, people always have a bias towards larger organisms. So like, um, people will look at the types of insects that live in river systems, for example. Yeah. Um, they use the types of insects that live in the rivers under these different conditions, uh, you know, like how much oxygen is present because the oxygen is usually a limiting um, condition for respiration of fish. And temperature and oxygen are like the two primary controls for fish, for fish with respect to where they can lay their eggs and whether they can breathe or live in the water. And if you have water with very limited amounts of oxygen, for example, um, because you put a bunch of um, sewage in the water, for example, um, the sewage itself is, you know, not toxic to the organisms, but, um, but it has a bunch of nutrients and also a bunch of organic matter that then becomes decayed. And when it becomes decayed, it consumes all the oxygen out of that water, for example. So you can look at a combination of nutrient pollution from diatoms, and then you can look at the like oxygen water quality from aquatic insects. And you can actually get out in almost all environments, you can get a pretty good sense of what the water quality is like. And where the real value comes, like if you're thinking to yourself, why didn't they just stick a sensor in the water, right? Um, and then it will tell us how much oxygen it is and how much nutrients are in there. It will, um, there's nothing wrong with that model except for you can't really keep the sensor in the water very easily. And then if you do, it requires a whole bunch of maintenance, um, you know, because the sensors become, um, they need to be sort of reset and recalibrated frequently. And the problem is they're only gonna give you a snapshot. Um, while they're working, when they're functional, they'll give you like an instance of what's going on in that system, which is great if you have a lot of little instances but that also requires somebody to constantly come back out into the um, into this river system or whatever, right? And if they do, um, if you're thinking like, oh, is the people constantly coming into the system, it's actually um, more efficient. Just look at what lives in the water and what grows in the water because it's gonna tell you that information, but it's gonna have the memory of the system. So if you're there on a particularly hot day, you might have low oxygen levels, or if you have um, a, a power plant that's upstream that lets off a bunch of hot water, it might affect the oxygen levels. But um, the average conditions are the things that the organisms that are living in that environment are probably gonna tell you. They have a tolerance range, and so if it's outside their tolerance range, they won't live there. Um, and that's actually a little bit better from, you know, a monitoring the environment kind of approach because as the organisms actually live in the environment are telling you something about it and it's a little bit more expensive in the sense that you have to get somebody who knows you know what are those aquatic organisms are 
to analyze it, but the information it tells you is um, fundamentally a longer record than you get instead of it's just a snapshot. So um, also uh, what those instruments won't tell you is what was it like in the past. And if you already know what organisms tell you water quality today, um, and they leave skeletons, like diatoms will leave fossils, they necessarily tell you what the water quality was like in the past as well. So I can use that from lake settings or any place where there's um, uh, skeletal material to tell me what it was like 100 years ago, where we didn't have sensors in the water, or 50 years ago, or 20 years ago, when we didn't have an environment that was being monitored. And in many cases, the monitoring of river systems is in particular is relatively incomplete. Like USGS will have something, they'll run it for four or five years maybe, and then there's no more information from that thing or they'll put a new instrument in and then it'll run for a couple of months and then they get a new one they gotta put in. Sorry, uh, Ferrax. Called um, polymorphism, it is the mechanism that enables a parent to have one brood of young without wings while the next brood has them. This allows water striders to be very adaptable. Oh, awesome. So they, um, they have a generation with wings and the next generation without wings. Aphids are similar to this. Um, like the mother aphid comes out of the egg in the winter into the spring organism and then it hatches like, you know, like a billion aphids. Um, and then they'll go through this sort of process where they are wingless for a long time and then they'll sprout wings when it's time for them to seasonally to move to a different type of plant because the one that they're living on basically um, has a sh sort of phenology, right? A spring phenology and then a summer and then a late summer phenology. And they'll actually migrate that way where the, um, the organisms, some generations have wings and some generations don't. So it's kind of cool. Um, study of life. Dragonfly larvae are monsters, yeah. Dragonfly larvae are so cool. They um, they have uh, jet propulsion. They basically um, squeeze water out their butt to push themselves around. And uh, what can be better than that? Uh, insect that pushes itself around with a butt engine. I mean, that's just classic goodness right there. A butt jet. You know? Also, they're terrifying predators. Uh, they eat practically everything they <laughs> run into because uh, they got big mouths with giant jaws. Uh, so do actual dragonflies, by the way. Um, but they're super cool. I love dragonflies and I love taking pictures of dragonflies. And I kind of can't wait till it warms up just a little bit more. I've seen some dragonflies out. Uh, but it's the like meadow dragonflies I've seen out and they're so hard to track um, They're almost never anywhere, you know for long and so um, Right when they hatch and they uh, right when they sorry come out of the water They're not hatching, but they're switching from their larval phase to their winged phase They're next to the lakes, but it's a very short window and then they're gone. And they're impossible to keep up with um, so it's not like you can just go get some. I love dragonflies though. Uh, coliform bacteria are organisms that are present in the environment and in the feces of all warm-blooded animals and humans. Coliform bacteria are not likely causes and however their presence in drinking water indicates disease causing organisms or pathogens could be in the water system. Yeah. Uh, fecal coliform is definitely something that's problematic um, or at least indication of nutrient pollution, people pollution. Okay, my second battery is about to die. Is there a keystone species of the diatom? The diatoms are um, uh, autotrophs, so they're at the base of the food web and they don't really have, um, they don't need anything else as an organism for the most part. Um, Uh, I mean, I would think of diatoms themselves are kind of keystone, but not like at the species level typically, so. Okay, um, 
let's see, I've got an hour before Pacific Plankton stream starts. And so I think I'm gonna stop, plus my second battery is starting to die. And I do have a third battery, but I feel like it's uh, it's been going on for, stream's been going on for a really long time. Um, and even though it's a lot of fun, I streamed earlier and I had no intention of actually streaming right now. News, everyone. Uh, my daughter talked me into it so she could draw stuff uh, for people. And then uh, after three or four things, she basically had to go to bed. And then I just got sucked in because this is fun. And uh, it's fun hanging out with people asking questions. Oh, what camera am I using? I can answer some basic questions. Um, this is an uh, Olympus OMD EM1 Mark II. Yeah, there you go. And um, it's hooked up through a normal um, C mount camera adapter, which goes just out of the microscope in it. Um, it has a 0.7 magnifier on it, I think, or 0.8 uh, magnifier on it, which means it actually reduces the image a little bit going to the camera. And then um, it's just hooked through a, a micro HDMI cable into a camera capture card in the back. And it's my preferred tool, even though I have a camera that was mounted on um, my lab microscopes to use this because um, the camera that came with it is like a five megapixel camera and this one streams 4K if I want. So um, I'd much rather have the 4K camera on here. Um, plus it has a nice optical digital zoom and um, that's what we mostly are zoomed in on. And uh, um, it, I think it works really well with the DIC and I know how to control it a lot better than a regular camera that is run through the software that the company sells you. Plus it's cheaper than the camera. Yeah, the images are nice and clean and they look even better if I take it up to 20x. So I forgot we've been burning around on 10x. Um, so um, everything would look even better if I took it up a notch to the higher magnification. Um, you can really see the high quality image. Yeah. So, all right. Um, I want to thank everybody for hanging out. This has been a really fun stream. Study and uh, and uh, was just a ton of questions and good stuff. Olivia, thanks for hanging out too. Um, Ferox, uh, people are just jiggly enough. We've had just a ton of really great sciencey interactions, and I hope everybody um, kind of enjoyed just hanging out. There's a diatom crawling around right there. Um, uh, checking out what's in my koi pond. Um, it's been it's been a lot of fun, and. Um, second stream for one day i'm getting ready for my third um i will be back Good on news, um, vocally on pacific plankton stream in about 50 minutes she streams so i'm going to send you for now off to somebody else we should raid somebody and i have a bunch of friends that are on right now and um i don't know i've got uh, music streamers that are my friends some science people that are my friends and uh, art people that are my friends. So just pick one of those and then I'll, um, I'll base it off of that. Um, whatever you're interested in, that's what we'll go to. So uh, speak up somebody, tell me what it is. Science, okay, James, we will stick with science and uh, I will pick one of my science streaming friends. Uh, let's go get paleontologizing then. I think that's all I have. Uh, for science streamers except for Rams Reef and they're just an aquarium um, a great aquarium but um, what I would recommend viewing but um, uh, paleontologizing will probably be ending ending their stream in a while so um, but uh, we've been streaming each other regularly uh, and raiding each other so um, that's a good choice. Um, paleontologizing has uh, got a great way with talking to people. And um, uh, he'll probably come raid Pacific Plankton when he's done. So we can just hand you off to him for an hour or so. And then I'll see you guys again, or I'll hear you, uh, or you'll hear me, rather, if you come back for Pacific Plankton stream, which I hope you will. So um, 
if you're not going to follow the raid and you still want to catch Pacific Plankton, that's her uh, her address. And like I said, we're buddies, uh, streaming buddies, and uh, real life buddies. And um, she's my mod, and I'm her mod. So I'm going to be in there moderating. And um, uh, it's sort of like this, only sea creatures instead of uh, freshwater creatures. So um, if you enjoyed it, you'll really enjoy that as well. OK, um, I think that's it for tonight, at least until I show up vocally on Pacific Plankton's Discord. I want to really thank everybody again, and we will go get uh, paleontologizing. So it's going to talk about fossil stuff, dinosaurs, uh, evolution, all kinds of cool stuff. All right. Good night, everybody.